the fractures inside the Democratic Party are really starting to lay bare. Oh my, did they, they laid bare on Monday in both the House and the Senate. Um, in the House, it was over the, it's, it, it kind of came to a head uh, when the Republicans walked out uh, prior to the final vote on the property tax bill. <laughs> A gigantic sigh of relief you feel all over the state is because the legislative session is over. Thank God. So we're recording this about two days after the session is over. Whether you're watching this on TV, YouTube, or listening to it on the podcast, we're recording it just after the session. Marianne Goodlin is, of course, the Capitol reporter for Colorado Politics, the Springs Gazette, the Denver Gazette. Uh, neighborhood newsletters. Uh, if you write it on napkins, <laughs> you should put it in the bottle. Um, let's let's go over this session because it it was it was nuts. Um, yep. And it shouldn't be nuts at all. The Democrats have a super majority in the House. Correct. They have. A near supermajority. All they need is one squishy Republican in the Senate. Correct. And they have a progressive governor, a Democrat. They have everything. There shouldn't have been a surprise. There shouldn't have been a problem. There shouldn't have been any drama. This should this should have been a cakewalk of a legislative session. Yet it wasn't. If you could have like a word or a bumper sticker to describe the tenor of this session. What was it? You've seen enough of them. Oh, nuts is pretty good. (laughs) Nuts is pretty good. Nuts is pretty good. We saw a lot of things that happened this year that we've never seen before. And and I, I would keep going back through my mind and through my own records to say, has this ever happened before? Is it, I, I spent a lot of time just kind of track the things that were going on that I'd never seen before. And like what? Uh, the imposition of rules, and, and, and mostly this is what applies to the state house, where you have a 46 to 19 Democratic advantage. Super majority for the first time in Colorado history. Yeah, and, and for Democrats, it's never happened before. Right. And I, I kept going back to say, has this ever happened before? You know, I'd, and there were things going on that I'd never seen before. The imposition of rules around um, limiting debate, which was uh, something that started happening roughly around right before the the budget got over to the House. You started to see a lot of that. And I kept looking back and say, I can't remember anybody ever imposing a limit on debate before. And I could, the only thing I could find was uh, back in the 2000s where there was a discussion of it, but it never happened. Yeah, I don't remember that ever happening. And I've been watching this stuff for closely for three decades. And, and even as a kid, kind of as a hobby. You've got everything, Democrats. I've never seen, let me put it, my word, might be hubris. And I've never seen witnesses being toyed with, yelled at. Um, It was very odd to see some of the witnesses being I'm going to say abused. Maybe there's a better word for that, it. That actually is not all that unusual, depending on who the committee chairs are. Um, and I've seen committee chairs you, sitting while other committee men or women have been, you know, yelling or being rude to people giving testimony. And it was odd because you have all the votes. We know how this is going to go. This is just for show. There's no reason to be nasty. You just say, thank you for your testimony. And that's it. And you move on. Thank you for your testimony. Limiting testimony is an oddity. I've rarely seen that happen. Usually you just Actually, uh, no, that is, that, uh, depending, and, and then later in the session you get, the more limitations get put on, on testimony. Where I mean, if, you, if, there's, if there's thousands of people, yes. If there's hundreds of people, yes. If there's 50 people, usually 
you, you, you put a cap on the, the amount of time. Sometimes it's just, you know, 20 people and you say, all right, we're going to limit it to three minutes each and you, you, you suffer through it. You see caps on almost every, everything now. You didn't used to. No, no, that's true. There, but, but you also didn't have hundreds of people showing up right. to testify on things, except if it was like super, super controversial. Usually gun and abortion bills just right. draw people out in, in droves and they would limit it then. But now limiting testimony is pretty much a standard. Uh, you know, everybody gets their three minutes. And even we had a couple of instances this year and then, and I've seen this before too, where the committee chair will say, we're going to limit testimony on this bill in its entirety to four hours, six hours, eight hours, something like that. You don't see it all that often, but you, we did see some of that this year. And we've, and we've seen that in the past too, particularly as you got later and later in the session. I need your help in understanding the property tax going right up to the end. Uh, so the, the two bills that I need your expertise, of course, is the governor's signature bill that failed, uh, which b was bizarre for me, but the property tax one, which I found to be one insulting that they waited until one week to the end of the yeah. session, which was, you know, all of us knew they needed to deal with this. Yeah. They had 120 days to deal with this issue, and they waited until uh, the last week, dropped something out when they had no time to have really stakeholder process, mm -hmm. no uh, real testimony, no way for the rest of us to weigh in with options. And um, it was, for me, a, a rare example of the governor blowing it. I mean, just, you know, here's our idea, and... When, when you have Kyle Clark a Channel 9 going, Governor, we're not stupid. We see what you're doing. You're stealing our Tabor refunds and calling it tax, uh, uh, property tax That's relief. Right. We're not dumb. Um, I could tell that the governor was like, oh, they, we got caught on this one. He pushed it through at the last minute, mm -hmm. but it seemed like they were willing to compromise. Or what, what was the story behind um, uh, this one, which was, I think... 303. Correct. It went all the way up to the last minute, and it looked like it might not make it. It looked like it was going to get completely discombobulated. It got tied in with Prop HH, and, and it's just, it's a mess. And first of all, why did they wait to the last minute? Uh, I've got my own theories. You tell me. They've actually had two years to deal with this issue. This really goes back to when voters okayed the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment in the 2020 election. And they knew, the, you know, the governor and his allies and, he, and virtually everybody that's involved in this issue, local county te assessors and county governors, everybody knew this was coming. Once Gallagher got repealed, there was no, no limitation on, on raising assessment rates uh, and because Gallagher put some pretty tight controls over all of that. And that was the intention of Gallagher when it was passed back in the 1980s, was to make sure that you didn't have exactly what we're seeing right now, which is this explosion of, of uh, ass assessment rates and much higher and skyrocketing property taxes. And the idea, if I, if I got this right, which was, hey, when, when property tax, uh, when valuations go skyrocketing, yep. that assessment rates should go down, basically, to make sure our taxes stay roughly the same. The same thing with Tabor, which was, we're gonna have, the um, as property values go <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make sure that property uh, rate or uh, uh, taxes, tax rates can go down, so the tax rates stay the same. And it was working very well until the legislature uh, put on this uh, ballot question, which I think was very, deviously worded, which said, without raising tax rates and for rainbows and kittens and everything else, shall we do this? It's like, well, it's not going to raise tax rates. Why not? But it doesn't raise tax rates, but it changed those assessment rates. Yes, it did. So what it did meant the rate stays the same, but as your house value goes up, then your property tax goes, goes up. up. Well, and and... After Gallagher passed, 
The repeal of Gallagher. The repeal of Gallagher yeah. passed. Everybody knew you had a, you had some time to, to figure this out. And they knew a year ago, because if you remember, the very last bill that came out of the legislature a year ago was also about property taxes. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, this was, uh, I want to say Senate Bill 238. I think that was the, the number of it. And what they did is that they put aside a, a pot of money, $700 million, that was going to be used to keep property taxes low for this year, for 2023 and 24. And that was going to buy them time to come up with a solution. So to, this is actually a two-year problem. And, they, and the governor talked about this during his State of the State address. He said, we're going to have a short-term fix, which is this $700 million pot. And he threw another $200 million into it in this budget cycle. And then we'll come up with a long-term fix, too. And you, and you had a bunch of new lawmakers um, come in this year who also were very, very committed to working on this issue. And they were putting bills out in January. The first bills of the session from people like Lisa Frizzell, who is a Republican and a former county assessor. Nobody knows this issue among the 100 lawmakers. Nobody knows this, better, this issue better than she does. She had bills that she was introducing right at the very beginning of the session to say, Here's, here's a short-term fix. And her short-term fix was to suspend the assessments this year and put it off for one year, which would give everybody time to come up with a solution. And she worked with, I want to say, I believe it was Senator Byron Pelton, who's from Sterling. Uh, and they were, they were going to come up with a task force that would spend time coming up with a long-term solution. Bringing together stakeholders County is, assessors, you know, the people who are the experts in this area. It's kind of the old way of, of doing these things, which was, all right, let's bring together the people who know this stuff and the people who are impacted by this stuff. Let's get them around the table, have them argue it out from their different points of views instead of waiting to the last minute and have the governor riding in on a white horse and just drop something with no time to... No time to no talk time. about it. So what happened to that? Well, the... The thing with Frizzell's bill, it died in committee, not because people thought it was a bad bill. They, they thought it was actually a very good bill, but they're like, well, let's just see and let's wait for the governor's proposal to come along. We really can't do this until we see what the governor wants to do with that. So they killed it. They killed it. And, and then, you, you know, 10 days before the end of the session, maybe not even that, maybe eight days before eight the end days. of the session, all of a sudden this, the governor finally drops this property tax fix that he, you know, and he got in front of everybody and said, this is both the short, the short term and the long term solution. And everybody went, ah. It was a real embarrassment. Not only is it a real embarrassment for the governor, it's, it is a lose lose thing for every taxpayer. Um, as I said, to have Kyle Clark going, we're not stupid. We see what you're doing, which is you're, you're, you're destroying Tabor, you're taking our refunds, not taking all of them at first. But over, over the ten, long run, over ten years, oh, which is the long term, right? And not only alleged that, a long term fix. As our Ben Murray here at Independence looked at it and said, "Well, it's only for ten years, but if you read the bill, it says the legislature can then renew that for another ten years, yeah, without a vote of the people, and then they can do it for another ten years, which of course they will do. Why wouldn't they do it? it it's more money for them without a vote of the people." So yeah. Tabor refunds are gone forever. Well, and nobody believes that Tabor refunds were going to last forever anyway. I mean, voters keep approving and Democrats keep sending to the ballot things to chop away at, we're going to take this out of the Tabor surplus, which, of course, reduces... Well, they don't send it to the people, let's be honest. They keep calling them fees, so they don't send it to I'm, the people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things like, like these, prop, these propositions on affordable housing and healthy meals and, and all that kind of stuff. That's coming out. Some of that is coming out of the Tabor surplus, right. and by the which way, reduces the Tabor refund. And if they ask the people, that's fine. But the large which majority of that is fees and tax credits that they don't ask for. Uh, a lot of most of it is is the hospital provider fee and the faster fees. And uh, you can just keep on and on and on. So, yeah, they're stealing our, our tax refunds by calling them fees. Very rarely do they ask us for it. When they ask us for it, fine. That's, that's the idea of Tabor. So 
So now voters will say, oh, look, we get a little bit of, 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 um, of property tax release, relief. Explain this, this thing where if we vote for this, then everybody gets a check. But if we don't for, vote for it, then we don't actually all get a check. No, everybody gets a check regardless okay. of how a weather proposition HH passes or, or not. The, the bill that passed in the last three days of the session, the one that went into a committee hearing and nobody got to actually see until that committee hearing was halfway over and it was only a 25 minute hearing to begin with. Um, this is House Bill 1311. Nobody got to see. No, nobody saw the bill. Uh, the only people who saw it was the one person who testified in favor of it from the Colorado Fiscal Institute. She knew what was in it because I, I su suppose they probably helped they, write they wrote it. it. They wrote it. Literally, she and the Democrats on the committee were the only ones who knew what, this, what was in this bill until halfway through that committee hearing. As a journalist, how do you feel about that? Outraged. Why? That, p the public needs to see what they're doing and, and sliding these bills in, and, and, it, it happened, and it happens way more than I would ever like to see. But these things need to be properly vetted, and the public can't vet this stuff if they can't see it. And this, this particular bill um, wasn't online until the hearing literally was halfway over, and I just thought that was outrageous. You had Natalie Menton, who, who you know, uh, was there to testify on the bill, and she said, I, I can't testify on this because I haven't seen it. And, and by the time it was actually available, it was complicated enough that you needed time to look at it and read it, for heaven's sakes. And they're just and that they time had, wasn't there. They had 120 days yep. to work on this. And instead, they put forward a bill and vote on it. And the people can't see it until it's voted on. Just about. Would you? Just about. How is that different than a secret government? Not a whole lot secret, but, but I want to go back to what's in yeah. that bill. Um, it equalizes Tabor refunds. So that, and this is similar to what happened last year with the Great Colorado Payback that was actually your Tabor refund that you got early. Um, everybody would get the same amount, $661 is one number that I've heard. Joint filers get $1,322. Um, and it would come at the same time that your Tabor refunds normally come, which is when you file taxes in April. Normally what the state relies on, and this is what would happen if Proposition HH doesn't pass, is a six-tiered sales tax refund mechanism that is graduated and based on your income level. So higher paid or higher income Colorado's get a bigger Tabor refund. Folks at right. the lower end of the scale get a lower refund. The reason the Democrats did this and they coupled these things together was because the Tabor uh, refund that, or the Tabor ballot measure for the property taxes that takes part of that Tabor refund had a very big problem that came out immediately. And this is kind of what Kyle Clark was going after. Um, renters would lose part of their Tabor refund and get nothing in return because they don't get property tax relief. They're, they're not, you know, they're, they're renters, they're not, they're not homeowners. And at the same time, because the property tax relief is not, it, it's just that you're not going to, your property taxes aren't going to go up as much. There's some, some decreases in valuation that will help take that down a little, but everyone's property taxes are still going to go up no, ma no matter what. And if you're a, a person who owns rental rental property, you know, second, third homes, right. apartment buildings, that kind of stuff, you don't get quite the break from Senate Bill 303 that a homeowner is going to get. Right. And you're going to raise your rental rates, right? So the renters are not only losing part of their Tabor refunds, but they're going to see higher rents on top of it. So this is like a double whammy. And this people picked up on this immediately, that renters were going to really pay the price for this for this thing. So that's where this other bill came from. If you equalize all of the um, Tabor refunds so that everybody gets the same amount, people at the lower end of the income level are going to get much, much higher uh, Tabor refunds than they would have gotten. People who pay, who are at the higher end of the income range are not only going to get lower Tabor refunds, but their property taxes are actually going to go up more. Right. 
what it is is a re redistribution. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a redistribution. That, that's why the folks at the Colorado Fiscal Institute who love redistribution wanted this. And that's why the Democrats didn't share it with anybody until they passed it. Which is why it waited until the last three days of the session. Isn't that devious? I'm not crazy about it because it doesn't give the, po the public an opportunity to see what their government is doing. And they already uh, have a supermajority. Mm -hmm. They're not in danger of, you know, a bunch of rich guys going down there and shaking their fists. They're outnumbered. There's nothing they can do. They have the numbers. So why the hubris of, of a smoky filled back room to cut this deal with, with those who want socialism and redistribution? You've got the votes. You're not in any danger. You could have done this at the beginning of the session. You could have done it out in the open. And so, so this, this whole idea of, of open democracy and uh, transparency just goes, goes down. And for yeah. people like you who, who are reporters, you, you have to report it after the fact. Yeah, and it's, and it's difficult for us, too, because you want to get the best and brightest minds to weigh in. What's, you know, what, what's really going on with this measure? Well, it's hard for us because those folks don't know any more about it than anyone else. You know, we're all scrambling to figure out what the heck does this thing do. And property taxes, all taxes, can be a complex subject. In which incredibly is why, complex. That's why the assessor who is now a state rep, has a very good handle on this. Yeah, she does. And so, you know, to kill her bill right off the bat and, you know, throw it aside at the beginning of the session in favor of the governor dropping a bill with one week to go without any sort of stakeholder process is the height of hubris. Which brings me to 303. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 213. 213 was the governor's signature bill. Absolutely. When he said, we're going to have a home for every budget. And he put forward this bill, which had a lot of really good parts in it. From my point of view, as somebody who, who likes the idea that people can do with their property more what they like and frees up some of this crazy local control that tells people, you know, you can't do anything with your property. Um, but then again, there are people who say, no, we want local zoning control, so you, 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 you can't put a slaughterhouse on your property next to my home. I get that as well. This, pro this bill was basically to take away a lot of local zoning control and mm -hmm. force density in cities that wouldn't like it or areas that wouldn't like it. That's correct. And uh, it was built on what I believe to be a complete false premise that density, infill, putting homes in people's backyards means lower uh, housing costs. If that were the case, Boulder, Denver, Portland would be the cheapest places to live. It's not. Uh, Randall O'Toole at the Independence Institute has done a ton of work showing density does not equal low home prices. And in a place like Colorado, where 98% of the land that can be developed hasn't been developed, you know, the reason we don't have affordable homes is because of growth control and urban growth boundaries, and we, we don't talk about that stuff. But That, by the way, is going away because they passed a bill in the legislature to get rid of those growth caps. In some areas. I, I, you can't, I can't imagine Boulder is going to... Actually, um, if you talk to the mayor of Boulder, and I did when that when really? that bill was announced. It was announced at the same time that the governor's housing bill was announced. This was a bill that was run run by Representative William Lindstadt, who's Broomfield. Right. And that is sort of ground zero for growth caps because of because Boulder imposed its growth caps back in the seventies, I think. Yeah, it's called the Danish plan after Paul Danish. Yes. But uh, when you talk if you talk to Aaron Brockett, he's all and I said, Are are you okay with having your growth cap you know, basically thrown out the window. He was fine with it. That's because there's no more space to build in Boulder. That's very true. Yeah, so because they have the urban growth boundaries and the open space, and so there's just, you know, there's no 
there's no place to grow, and well, they have a cap on how high you can grow. Yes. So there's just no place. And yeah. we're fine with that. There's only yeah. so many shoes you can shove in the closet. So yeah. Well, yeah. he he said he was fine with with that particular measure, which surprised me a little bit. But but that's 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 what he told me, and that's what I reported. Um, so but, why at the at, at the end of the day, this the the signature bill of this remarkably popular governor, it ran out of time, and it didn't work. Now help me understand if one bill. You know, this one was dropped early, and this not that early. It was not, like a month out, a month before still, the end of the session. You know, this one was really controversial. You had some guys who just loved it. You had Colorado Concern and some business folks who kind of liked it and kind of didn't. Why didn't it make it? This help me understand how it ran out of time. Let's start off with who is in the legislature. You have a lot of people, a lot of elected lawmakers who come out of local governments, city councils, county commissions. Um, and so they all have relatively close relationships with those local elected officials. And the local elected, uh, the organizations that represent those local electeds lost their minds over this bill. Uh, number because one, it was the a, state would take control away from local, local governments about um, what they can do in their own backyards. It's unconstitutional, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's 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 kind of the starting point that everybody came from when that bill first came out. How so? Uh, tell, tell me how. Our constitution has something called home rule, and we have dozens upon dozens of cities and towns who have enacted home rule charters. And under home rule, you're kind of allowed to make a lot of your own decisions. It's in the Constitution. It's been there for 150 years. And to take away the authority of cities, particularly those who have adopted home rule, it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has ruled over and over and over again, thou shalt not take away the authority of home rule. So. And that is the first, the first thing that it ran into, and people, and people with all that local elected experience, people like Rachel Zenzinger, who came out of the Arvada City Council, and she was kind of the leader of the opposition from the Democrats side. And she's a Democrat. And she's a Democrat. So we're, we're, we're talking about D on D violence down at the legislature. Here. Absolutely, and and she came out very early against that that unconstitutional portion of 213, and she said, that's a line I won't cross. Really? Oh, yes. I, and I reported this at least a couple of times. She absolutely refused. And then you have, on the Republican side, you have Barb Kirkmeyer, the, who spent 20 years as a county commissioner and kind of led the opposition uh, on in, in the Senate, at least, on the Republican side. She had the same problem with it. And then you have groups like the Colorado Municipal League, which, which represents 270 cities and towns. And I think only Boulder was the only one that actually said, yes, we're good with 213. That you one had... blew my mind. Can I, let me make a detour. Yeah. yeah. If there was one city that you would think would be screaming hell no, because you know Boulder is a command and control central, and they love to micromanage their town right down to you know where people can put their closets you would think it would be Boulder. Why was Boulder the governor's only ally? Is it because the governor lives there? I, that, I, that could be. I, I, I never did figure out why. But would you agree with me? That, that, is, know, an odd, that is a really odd thing, right? Yeah, it is okay. an odd thing. But Boulder was the only, the only city council that said, yes, we're good with this. Even, even um, the communities that surround Boulder, Superior, right. Uh, they want, Broomfield, all don't, uh, the state. Don't you tell me what to do in my own me, home rule yeah, town. Don't, don't tell me what to do in my own home rule town. And you would have some outliers. You might have one city council person or one right. county commissioner somewhere. The governor might go was, back to Boulder being, we're full. I mean, there's yeah. very little room to, to really rebuild. You know, it, they've already done as much, a lot of infill. If, if you can put a you know, mother-in-law plot in your backyard, a lot of yeah. people have already done that. Well, and but back to my other point, which is you had a handful of, of local elected officials who would come in and say, yes, we support this, but the, the whole rest of my 
city council or my county commission says absolutely not, and they would adopt even going as far as to adopt resolutions or statements or whatever that said, we don't support this. And then, and then you look at the mayors of Denver, Aurora, and Colorado Springs, who all said, we don't support this. To get John Southers, Mike Kaufman, and Michael Hancock on the same page, hmm, extraordinary. And I, I give credit to Hancock, and I hate giving credit to Hancock on anything, but for him to be the, one of the first mayors to stand up and go, fellow Democrat, uh, Jared governor. Bullis, no, yeah, governor, no, I'm not with you on this. I think that gave credibility, and he was the first one in the swimming pool to say, Democrats, it's okay to, to come out against the governor. Because I got a sense a lot of Democrats in the legislature were like, well, I'm still weighing my options, when really they were just looking for a signal to say, it's okay to come out against this. And maybe Zenzinger was, was one of those and as well. And she, she definitely, she was the canary in the coal mine on this one. Really? When, and, but then go back and look at how the House voted on this. You had nine yeah. Democrats that voted against this bill, including the majority leader, Monica Duran, so, which, which to me also really stood out. Will, and, will, the governor, will the governor bring back this bill in a special session? I mean, I'm hearing mm -hmm. all sorts of rumors. What, it, Un he, unlikely. Really? I'm, I, I, I don't think it's likely. I, and I asked, him, I asked him about this, um, about what lessons he learned. I asked him this yesterday. Uh, this was Tuesday. Does he cop to learning lessons? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he actually doubled down on it. Um, he, he said, I really like the version that came out of the House, which had put had restored um, what the Senate took out, which primarily was this whole issue of state control of zoning. I really like this, and I want to go back to middle housing, which is duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, um, very high density housing, and that also came out of the bill when it came out of the Senate. And he's like, I want that back. And it, it, it was like, he, he wants to put everything back that, that got taken out of the bill in the first place, which tells me that he's, you know, he's, he's going to, he wants to try again. He didn't say anything about doing a special session. We thought if there was going to any chance for that, it would have been over the property tax issue. But given that both of those other measures pass. That was that was sort of the end of that conversation, but that that's really... I don't. I, he needs time to regroup and figure out how to get the folks in these local communities, these these county commissions, these city city councils, how to get them off of this. Because I and I heard this repeatedly from the folks who represent all of those those or, those groups. Had that bill succeeded. It would, have, it would have been tied up in the courts for years. They would never have allowed it to go forward. They would have sued over the unconstitutional nature of it. So, and, and you, and I, I know you don't play a lawyer on TV. No. But from, from your years covering this, you don't think it would have stood constitutionality? You think it would be overturned? Well, the, uh, the folks from CML and, and some of their attorneys repeatedly pointed to the fact that the Supreme Court has upheld the rights of local governments on the zoning issue under, under the, whole, the whole home rule uh, language of the Constitution. There are decades of rulings from the Supreme Court upholding a, the authority of local governments. So you want to do this, change the Constitution, then do this. Uh, I don't see that happening either. Right. The, but, there, but there's an interesting sidelight to this, and I was talking to somebody about this um, today. The governor really uh, earned himself lots of folks who are not on his side over this housing issue. The, again, the cities, the counties, the people who serve on all of those things. Who does he need to have as allies when that ballot measure comes up in November? And who does he not have as allies? That's fascinating. Because the cities and counties, and the counties in particular, because they're the ones who were uh, the most impacted by a reduction in property taxes, and of course, 303 is supposed to take uh, a lot of money and, and make and backfill to hold them harmless. If if there if there's any chance of them losing money because the property tax revenues aren't going to be what they were anticipating, you've got to have the support of those counties in order to 
and, and or at least it would certainly help you. Let, if me, you, let me see if, I, if I'm following you, Marianne, because yeah. this is fascinating. All things being equal, these municipalities would not want this proposition to pass because if it fails, they're just going to get more money. And if it does pass, they're certainly going to need the uh, uh, the state to backfill them. Yes, absolutely. But they're still not going to get backfilled all the way, I'm imagining. You know, all things being equal, they would just like to have this huge windfall that's going to come to them because Gallagher got repealed. Right. They're sitting pretty right now. Uh, you know, they're going to get a, a massive windfall. And they're they're all looking like this right now. Ooh, Gallagher's gone. This is good. Um so if if the governor wants to get this thing passed, he, he's going to need to have He's going to need friends in the county that he, that he doesn't have. start off with, with this thing. I believe you have it, sir. Why didn't I see that? Why didn't I see that one coming? That's genius. All right. Thank you. Help me, help me out with this one. Um, and I've been waiting for somebody to really spell this out. Uh, I've seen the media... You know, going, Republicans are all evil, Republicans are doing this, Republicans are doing this. It's about time that uh, there are more stories, and you've been doing them, that the fractures inside the Democratic Party are really starting to lay bare. Oh, my. Did they, they laid bare on Monday in both the House and the Senate. Um, in the House, it was over the, it's, it, it, it kind of came to a head. Uh, when the Republicans walked out uh, prior to the final vote on the property tax bill, 303. Why did they walk out? I mean, I don't blame them. They're, you know, they, you get dropped this, this uh, I was going to use vulgarity, but I'm much more sophisticated now. And who knows, my mother, my mother might be listening in. That's right. And she would not want me to say dropping this huge turd in the last week. So I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is that the governor dropped this terrible bill and without any stakeholder process, and without any time to, to work on it. And so the, the, the Republicans were like, this is ridiculous. We can't argue it. We can't debate it. We can't do anything. It's your thing. We can't play anyway. We're leaving. I don't blame them for leaving. It, it wasn't, you know, they had nothing to do with it. They could pass it without it. And so they did. I'll give you a perfect example of why they walked out. Um, in the final vote on, on 303 on Monday, um, Democrats put up two more amendments to put onto the bill, one w which was more or less technical, and then the other one was fairly substantial. It was a way to get the fire districts happy about the bill to make sure they also were included in that backfill, right? So they had those two amendments, and you have to get special permission to offer a third reading amendment before a final vote. Oh, yeah, it's pretty rare, isn't it? Not well, if, mostly it's done for technical reasons because right. somebody's found it found found a comma in the wrong place, yeah, or there's, that, you know, that, that needs to be a semicolon, not a colon. Yeah, right. yeah. Most of the time, it's to fix technical issues. This was a substantial amendment, or what how what most people would define as a substantial amendment. It wasn't technical. It was actually making a fairly big change in the bill. So um, the Democratic sponsors got permission to do these, this, these two amendments, including this one that, that, that actually made some big changes. The Republicans wanted to offer a third reading amendment. They were denied. They weren't even given the opportunity. And that was, that was kind of it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. They said, we aren't being listened to. Our voices are being silenced. We've had it. And they walked out. Do you blame them? Not, not one bit. Um, they, have, they have had to deal with this issue of their voices being silenced on a lot of things over the last month of the session, um, the, the imposition of these rules that I was talking about earlier to limit debate, for example, um, they didn't, that meant that they couldn't get the amendments offered that they wanted because there was only a certain amount of time that they had to actually have these, to have these conversations. And they don't have, and they don't have a lot of tools. When you're, when you're down that many members, when you're, when you're less than a third of the body, uh, your ability to bring about any kind of change at all is very, very limited. Right. And, and, and that comes under the elections have consequences sort of, sort of rule. Um, the, the limitations that they, the, the one thing that they had left after all of the imposition of these rules was asking for bills to be read at length, right. uh, which they did 
over and over and over again, including on the last day they had 303 read at length. That was a 65 page bill. Right. That takes like an hour, better than an hour and a half of, of time to read. Um, that's it, That really is all that they had left. And they just feel like their voices have been silenced, that the Democrats aren't listening. And, and I, you know, I know the speaker has tried to work as much as possible with the Republicans. And that's gotten her pushback back to the point about things falling apart on the yeah, last so day. Me, that's got, that got her all kinds of pushback from the progressives in her caucus. So what is this fissure between the Democrats? What is this split? Where, where, where's this friction? Um, between sort of traditional Democrats, um, people who have a, lots of local government experience, people who are attorneys or come out of um, sort of longstanding nonprofits, that kind of thing. Then you have a batch of progressive Democrats uh, who come out of organizations that are less willing to, to play, play along. Like and, Emerge or uh, um, just, Progress Now, those type of more hardcore very, progressive much, organizations. Much, much more hardcore progressive organizations. And they came in with an agenda of their, of their own. Um, to, agenda of what? Uh, a, lot, a lot of rent control, uh, eviction bills, um, things dealing with harm reduction, just the and the things that they had worked on. This is social justice warriors. This is a yeah. redistributive socialism. Yeah, but they came in and expected to get a whole lot of things done that they that they lost on because they couldn't get support. Even uh, you know that you would see these bills go over to the Senate and die in the Senate. Uh, the assault weapons ban is a perfect example. Um, you had a very traditional, a more, not, maybe not a very, but a more traditional Democrat, Andrew B Basenecker from Fort Collins, who had his name on that bill for weeks and weeks and weeks, and all of a sudden the bill comes out and he's gone. He's, he's gotten off the bill because he knows that there's going to be a, an issue where it, if it gets over to the Senate, you're going to have people like Tom Sullivan working to kill it because he, he believes that this is something that should be handled at the federal level, not at the state level. And he's kind of the leader of, of that issue in the legislature. So it wound up being carried by a progressive Democrat and dying in its first committee hearing in the House because everybody knew, and the governor didn't want this bill on his desk. He was very clear about that. So all of his, the more traditional Democrats, all teamed up with the Republicans and killed the bill. What's the fallout going to be? Um, it's a good question. We've got one more session with this legislature. Correct. And then there's going to be an election. Correct. You know, and I, um, I can't imagine Republicans are going to have a great midterm election next year. I just don't, I, I'm not seeing anything, at least not yet. Things change at a dime in politics. You know they that. Can. You, you don't know what the economy is going to do. You don't know what Putin's going to do. You don't know what uh, Jerome Powell's going to do. You just no, don't know. You, yeah. All right. So, but I hear, I know, I hear rumors that, that the hardcore progressives are going to primary the, the so-called moderate Democrats. And in my world, those aren't moderate Democrats. I don't see any Roy Romer uh, Democrats out uh, in that legislature anymore. Uh, I, think I don't might. see any farmers out there. I don't see any old Pueblo Union Democrats in that legislature. Uh, not, not right now, there aren't. Um, but I, I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the Speaker of the House handles this, because she got, they just ripped her a new one on Monday in a, in a caucus meeting that took place immediately after the walkout by the Republicans, where there was a lot of yelling going on. People accused her they of- They, the progressives. This is the progressives were yelling at her and accusing her of being too conciliatory to the Republicans. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting. I, you know, this was, just, a, this, it, was uh, a so, tough, this was a tough year for her because she had to manage not only a huge caucus, but one that was pretty unruly at times. So maybe this is a good way to, to wrap this up here. So I'm looking at what looks like a, a super minority with its own dysfunctions that, you know, for the, I don't remember when the Speaker of the House got no votes for the, you know, for the, for the Speakerhood. It's like, come on, guys, this is, 
you know, we don't do this. There's just no reason to, to, to vote against the speaker being elected. This is just, you know, we don't, we, there's no reason not to do this. It, it's something that, that was happen. orchestrated outside the building and I won't say who, but it should for anybody that, that knows re state Republican party politics right now, it's not too hard to figure out. So who? Uh, you're a reporter. <laughs> Report. Uh, I, I would if I had actually reported that out, but I, since I haven't, I won't. Okay. You're going to tell me after the cameras are off. All right. So, so even in the Republican ranks, there is this dysfunction in, in the Republican uh, circles in the minority. Mm -hmm. So even in this super minority, there's this awful split and there's fighting going on. So and then in no, this... it's not as bad as it's been in past years, frankly, because really? because you had all the folks who were in who were sort of to the the far right of that caucus. They left. They didn't. They did, they decided not to run again. They went over to the Senate, right. or they were term limited. Okay. So so now you have yeah. that fighting in the supermajority now mm -hmm. of hardcore progressives, and then just leftist Democrats. Yeah, that's how fascinating. So the old saying that uh, total power corrupts totally. Uh, I got it kind of close. Something like something that. Something like that. Yeah, I, something I like that. It. All right, what should we be looking for in the future? Well, it'll be interesting to see what the governor comes back with on the housing issue. I don't. He he's not going to drop that. He's very clear that he's going to keep working on that one. Um, I don't see that in a special session, and I, and I'll tell you why I don't see it in a special session. When you do a special session. And John Hickenlooper learned this lesson the hard way. You've got to have all your ducks in a row so that once... The same mistake doesn't happen again. Yeah. Ah. I, I don't know if you remember, but in, in late 2017, there was a problem with that bill that you love so much, sustainability of rural Colorado, and there were some errors in it that had an impact on RTD. And he tried to bring the legislature back to fix that. And in the Senate, you had Senate President Kevin Grantham who said... We don't need to do this right now. We can wait till January. And the Senate, which was Republican controlled, uh, pretty much killed all the bills that came out of that special session. It was a waste of taxpayer money. You still, if you come back with, if the governor comes back with another bill that looks anything like the original version of 213, you're going to have the same problem. You, the special sessions tend to be very, very short, three days, five days tops. If you don't have everything greased, and ready to go, it's a waste of taxpayer money, and nothing happens. And I think the governor knows that. So the better the better thing is to take the summer, see if you can't figure out a way to get what he wants and still not trample on the rights of local governments. And and frankly, that amendment was there. Barb Kirkmeyer offered it. Let me put this forward. I'm not convinced that the property tax issue doesn't need some fixing, too. So I wouldn't be there surprised. There are plenty of people that were asking for a special session on that one, too. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't have to bring that one back for some fine-tuning in a special session. But the same rule applies. If you do a special session, you've got to have something that everybody's going to agree upon and ready to move on very, very quickly. If you have the same divisions that you had over it as you did this last time, it's a waste of money, waste of your taxpayer dollars. I am so glad you are down there every day because God knows I wouldn't want to be there. Marianne, thank you so much. You are very welcome. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.